19th century, a time when the ideas of free will and individual liberty dominated the intellectual sphere in France, the world of prostitution still remained a very controversial and contested topic. Between acceptance with strict regulations and outward ban, the lives of professions of prostitutes had long been at the mercy of lawmakers, moralists, and religion. At the center of, the, of contemporary debates about prostitution are the female body and sexuality, along with women's rights to a profession and enjoy relative fin financial independence. Prostitution was truly a woman's world. From madams to procuresses to professionals or occasional prostitutes, prostitution offered a unique means of making an extra or necessary income as women could move easily in and out of the profession. However, with the passing of several new laws which tightened regulations of prostitution and increased the power of the police, the 18th century marked a transition from relative toleration to strict police persecution and repression in the French capital. Lawmakers and moralists' rising anxiety about prostitution was reflected in these new regulations and in the growing genre of reform literature about prostitution. Male reform writers imagined utopian solutions to the prostitution problem, which working hand in hand with the new laws reinserted men in a profession and a culture that was dominated by women. By studying Le Code de Citer ou Lit de Justice d'Amour by Jean-Pierre Moët, written in 1746, L'Homme en Société by Henri Goyon, written in 1763, Restif de la Bretonne's Le Pornographe, written in 1769, and Le Code ou Nouveau Règlement sur les lieux de prostitution dans la ville de Paris, written anonymously in 1775, it becomes evident that through a proposed strict organization of the world of prostitution, these Enlightenment projects aimed at reasserting men's controls over these women's bodies and their work. Reform texts and the relationship between Enlightenment and prostitution do not yet figure in the historiography of prostitution in 18th century France. However, my project is greatly indebted to the work of scholars of 18th century prostitution, notably Erika Marie Benevou's book La Prostitution et la Police des Meurs au XVIIIe siècle from 1987, uh, the first comprehensive study of prostitution in Paris in the 18th century. Her work inspired other scholars to study prostitution, notably Clyde Plumosil's book Prostitution et Révolution, Les Femmes dans la Cité Républicaine, and Julia Torley's 2018 book, Le Monde de la Prostitution à Paris au XVIIIe siècle. Also important is Nina Kushner's work on high society prostitutes and courtesans, and more recently, the work of Marion Pluscota on prostitution in the port cities of Nantes and Bristol, which offers a rare non-Parisian look at prostitution. Building on this already existing scholarship, the study of reform project imagined by male writers approaches the topic of prostitution from a different angle. Often overlooked because they did not lead to any concrete reforms, these four texts inform the modern reader about how their authors perceive the role of women as imagined threats to the good moral standing of society, the male desire to control women's bodies and work, and the role of the male gaze and male fantasy in the creation of utopia. De la Bretonne's Le Pornographe is the only one of the four texts to have had significant influence in the French capital. Already a well-established author, De la Bretonne's text, text was widely spread in Paris and was also published in the Mémoire Secret of 1769, and references to his Partignon appear in several Cahiers de Doléances. These texts illustrate the male author's great anxiety about women who were not dependent on a male relative and who controlled their own life and work. In addition, this approach to prostitution also reveals the influence of Enlightenment thought and culture and its application to a concrete topic which affected a significant part of Parisian society. The four texts chosen for this study stand apart from other contemporary writings on prostitution, such as the libertine or pornographic literature of the 18th century, in which prostitutes were often characters, in their goal and in the way that prostitutes are represented. Utopian reform texts do not try to appeal to a male audience by portraying prostitutes as objects of desire. Instead, 
Not only do the authors get directly give or subtly reveal their opinions about prostitution, but they also offer practical alternative to this growing problem in the French capital. These reform projects, projects are more akin to law texts than they are to activist pamphlets and correspond to a genre of writing typical of the 18th century and the Age of Enlightenment. In both their motives and their format, these texts are reminiscent of some of the greatest work by Enlightenment thinkers. We see in these projects the author's desires to improve society and their faith in the notion of progress, which originated with the Enlightenment. Men believed that any honest man could and should express his ideas, and that through education and legislation, they could reform their fellow men. By suggesting a rational organization of the world of prostitution and of society, these men's projects situate themselves in the same category as Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract about the establishment of political communities or Emile about uh, man's education. In addition to their general intent, these reform projects also qualify themselves as enlightenment texts by their format. Each is composed of a long introduction in which the author either retraces the long history of love and prostitution, implicitly states his position on prostitution and its place in society, and or gives a biographical short of his life and what led him to the topic. Following the introduction is a long series of numbered articles, each pertaining to a different aspect of the reform in great detail. Some of the texts, notably Restif de la Bretonne's Le Pornographe and Le Code de Citer by Jean-Pierre Mouet, end with tables detailing the costs and revenues generated by their projects. Um, this organization in articles is also a testament to the influence of Enlightenment thinking and writing on these authors and their projects. This style, similar to a law code, is incredibly representative of the 18th century, as it as it even is found in one of the most significant French texts of the century, the culmination of Enlightenment ideas, the Declaration of the Rights of Men and the Citizen of 1789. Uh, not only were these texts alike in their motive and format, but the projects created and described by Mouet, de Guayon, de la Bretonne, and the anonymous author also revealed great similarities in their views of how the regulation of prostitution should take place. Their general views reflected the recent changes that the French government had put in place during the late 17th century to limit prostitution and its visibility, which marked a turning point from relative toleration to police repression. Notably, Louis XIV's Grand Renfermement, Grand Renfermement Initiative of 1656, which promoted the incarceration of the poor, beggars, and prostitutes in the Hôpital Général. In their projects, the four authors adopted and expanded Louis XIV's Grand Renfermement policy and advocated for the institution of multiple houses of prostitution spread out throughout the city of Paris in which sex workers would systematically be incarcerated. These men's justification for the internment of prostitutes was twofold. First, their projects was a direct response to the health scare of the early modern period concerning venereal diseases. The second justification for these houses of prostitution was that they would improve society's moral standing. However, this is where the authors differ in their reasoning on how it would happen. Even though their original intents align, these authors had very different opinions on prostitution and its place in society, which was for some, uh, which was for some of them influenced by their own backgrounds and reflected in how they envisioned the roles of their houses as a moralist tool. When reading these texts, the authors are clearly divided into two categories. The first one with De Guayon and the anonym, an, anonymous author of the code was undoubtedly against prostitution and even expected that these houses would put an end to the practice. They believed in the stereotype of the prostitute as a seductress, a monstrous creature of desire who was responsible for all the afflictions of Parisian society. They believed that tightly controlling these women and the world of prostitution would give them the power to end debauchery and to atone for society's sins. On the other hand, both Mouette and de la Bretonne belong to the second category. 
Far from despising pr prostitutes and libertines, these two authors rather celebrate love, sex, and women. Instead of uh, ending prostitution, they hoped to reform it so that it could be less visible in the public sphere while still successfully operating in private. They saw prostitution as a necessary evil that, if forbidden, would only make way for worse alternatives. The differences between the two groups of authors regarding their sense in prostitution is crucial in understanding the disparities in their projects, as their views are heavily reflected in the organization of their houses of prostitution. The first group of authors, De Guayon and the anonymous author, who strictly opposed prostitution, imagined houses of prostitution that resembled pr prisons more than brothels. On the other hand, from Wet and de la Bretonne of the second group, their project was rather to create places of prostitution that perfectly catered to men's pleasure and men's fantasies. This opposition between prison and house of pleasure becomes evident in several aspects of the technical organization of the houses. Even though they are subtle, these differences are significant in understanding the intent of the authors and their personal representations of women and prostitutes. According to all four authors, each house of prostitution was to contain a precise number of women who would reside in said houses. However, the two groups dis disagreed on how to categorize and separate the women. While the first group wanted to divide them by social economic background, the second group preferred dividing them by age. By dividing women based on their social economic status, each type of prostitute would correspond to its clientele and prevent wealthier men from soiling themselves with poor women from a questionable background. While the authors of the first group considered debauchery to be one of the biggest threats to society's morals, interclass sex also seemed to be a significant concern. In addition, this model perpetrated an inescapable system of privileges where the first class women were educated and well taken care of, while the third class women lived in poverty that was prevalent in 18th century French society. For the second group, by dividing women by age, they focused on male pleasure. They put themselves in the mind of the client and not of the moralist to imagine a system where the fulfillment of men's fantasies was more important than propriety. This contrast between a prison project and a house of pleasure is evident in more than one aspect of the house's organization. Women's physical appearance and the way they dress was also a topic of disagreement between the two groups of authors. For De Guayon of the first group, prostitutes' clothing had a sole purpose, which was to set them apart from the rest of women, therefore allowing men to control prostitutes' whereabouts and facilitating their arrests. De Guayon's system of uniform was not meant to be flattering to the women's bodies, nor was it to keep up with the latest Parisian fashion. It was purely practical and relied on the shame associated with sex work during that time and place. From Wet of the second group, the uniform for his houses of pleasure were to be attractive and arousing for the male clients. In his Code de Cité, he plays the role of a fashion designer and chooses outfits for each class of women and for each season and dedicates three of his articles to the prostitute's wardrobe. For Mouet, prostitutes needed to be visually pleasing for the house's visitors. Unlike de Guayon, his goal was to showcase these women's bodies in a way that would speak to male sexual fantasies. Even though it may seem less strict, this system of uniforms still exercised control over the women's bodies as it rend rendered them objects of desire and deprived them of their personhood and individual agency. Imagining different categories of prostitutes or decided what they deciding what they should wear are just two of the many regulations that these authors wanted to impose on prostitutes' lives in their houses of prostitution. They had everything planned out, how often they bathed, what they should read, and what would happen to their children. In the scenarios that these male authors created, the women became passive recipients of their controlling male gaze. Mouet, de Goyon, de la Bretonne, and the anonymous author's male gazes controlled the women's bodies, their work, and ultimately the world of prostitution. Through their imaginations, these authors' true fantasy was to groom these women to their own personal liking, whether by locking them up in prison-like establishments or by turning them into, versions, into their version of an object of sexual desire. 
In addition to repossessing these women's bodies, through these reform projects, the male authors planned on taking over the world of prostitution. Procuresses and madams dominated the profession. Any girl who took part in prostitution was at some point under the authority of a procuress or a madam. In addition, prostitutes relied heavily on each other and created unique personal and work relationships, which provided them with an increased sense of security and support when practicing their trade. In their projects, these authors took over the role of the madams and procuresses and destroyed the support system of prostitutes. Each author assigned a male figure of authority to the houses that would supersede the female supervisors. Whereas the world of prostitution was very much a woman's world in 18th century Paris, by shifting the authority to that of a man and inserting themselves into the picture, these authors aimed at restoring men's power over these women's work and the world in which they lived. Finally, these men's projects significantly deprived women of the relative independence that they enjoy in the actual world of prostitution. Women could easily move in and out of the world of prostitution, as many of them had a different occupation during the day. In the author's projects, however, prostitution became a lifelong commitment. Even de la Bretonne, who was more sympathetic to prostitutes, declare that, quote, the girls, once they enter the house, shall never exit it. In the event that a woman wanted out of the profession, her choices were very limited. Entering a convent was the only option which would only perpetrate a life of confinement. By changing the essence of prostitution, in their projects, these authors denied prostitutes any freedom of movement and the possibility of professional reconversion. In other words, in these texts, any sign of female agency is completely lost. Despite their most valiant efforts, Moet, de Guayon, de la Bretonne, and the anonymous author failed to enact any real change to regulations of prostitution, and their projects never came to fruition. However, these texts are representative of a particular time and place and are an incredible window into the minds and imagination of four 18th century men. Whether they hoped to incarcerate prostitutes into a prison-like establishment, or they dehumanized them by portraying them as objects of male desire, all four authors were threatened by women who were not under the authority of a man, and they resented their exclusion from the all-female world of prostitution. By imagining a system where men's authority would prevail and women's ag agency would be erased, these authors revealed their anxiety about female enfranchisement. As Enlightenment thinking encouraged men to improve society and to reform their fellow men, independent women were then seen as yet another sign of moral decline that they could rectify. Thank you.